Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to this portion of the Black Awareness Week program for this year. And first, I'd like to um, make note of the events uh, of the week for the remainder of this week. Let's see where we're at. Tomorrow, beginning at 12.30 here in the Great Hall, our speaker for tonight will be giving a reading of some of his poetry uh, here in the Great Hall. That will be at 12.30. Uh, at 3 p.m. in the Pioneer, Pioneer Room, a sister from MIU University <clears throat> is going to uh, speak. Uh, that will be on the, in the Pioneer Room on what black awareness is. At 8 o'clock tomorrow night, uh, also here in the Great Hall, uh, for any Bid West enthusiasts, there will be a tournament. Um, the program indicates prizes for first, second uh, place. It will be double elimination, so any enthusiasts of that particular game should get some practice in tonight. Uh, Friday, beginning at 12.30 here in the Great Hall, uh, black students will uh, be discussing identification problems with classes and instructors here at Iowa State. Uh, on three at 3 o'clock on Friday, uh, there will be a taped speech, and I think I can say that this is tentative, so we'll have to check on this. Uh, Mr. Alex Poinsett, uh, this will be at the Black Cultural Center, the Black Mass Communicator. Speech was given uh, at Iowa State last year. And then Friday night, at, beginning at 7.30 here in the Great Hall, will be a uh, black student talent show, doing it the black way. Admission to that, uh, 75 cents. Saturday, April 26, at 1 p.m., will be a demonstration of uh, cornrowing, or hair braidings and styling techniques, uh, at the Black Cultural Center, 517 Welch. Sunday, April 27, in the Oak Room, which is the room directly behind this one, um, there will be a church service. Uh, presiding will be the Reverend R.B. Holmes from Delaware, Ohio. In addition to that, uh, the uh, group, the Gospel Soul Innovators, will be singing uh, in that. And also Sunday, 5 p.m., getting it together, a recognition banquet uh, for students, faculty, staff, and friends uh, this will be at the Maple Willow Larch Commons Dining Hall. If you're planning on attending that, that recognition banquet and you have yet to make your reservations, you can do so by calling the Office of Minority Programs, 294-8818 uh, or 8819. Our speaker for tonight was born in 1924, Salisbury, Rhodesia. He has degrees from Fort Hare and Witwatersrand Universities in South Africa. In 1963, he was arrested and jailed. He escaped, was shot and re-imprisoned at Robben Island. He was under house arrest in South Africa until in 1965 and was finally exiled from the country in 1966. He was responsible as president of the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee for the exclusion of South Africa and Rhodesia from the Olympic Games of 1968 and 1972. He is a professor of English at Northwestern University and is presently on leave teaching at the University of Texas at Austin. He is also an accomplished poet and hopefully many of you will be able to take part in tomorrow's poetry reading with him. Today in South Africa, possession of his work is a criminal offense. Black Awareness 1975 is proud to present Brother Dennis Brutus. Thank you. The theme for Black Awareness Week is, as you know, symbiosis. And I am glad to be part of the events of this week 
And I would like to believe that tonight will be part of a mutually beneficial relationship that I will be able to convey to you some information which will be of interest and value to you and that there will also be time for questions and discussion and an exchange of ideas so that I can feel that I too benefit from the event. I have been here before and I have made many friends here and so I am very pleased to be able to come back again. The topic for this segment of uh, symbiosis is the American-South African connection. And I think there are three questions one might ask depending on one's own level of awareness. Uh, one might in ignorance ask, is there an American-South African connection? And uh, there are people who are not aware of such a connection. And those who are aware might well ask uh, with some alarm, good heavens, uh, what's going on there? What are we up to in that part of the world? What does the South African and American connection signify. And the third question uh, is the one uh, to which I propose to devote some time and that is what exactly is the status of this connection at the present time and what is its immediate relevance for us now and indeed in the future as well. So, if I'm going to address these questions, uh, you will not think me arrogant if I begin by giving you things which you probably already know, uh, information which presumably most of you already know, but which seems to me uh, fairly basic just to lay the groundwork. What I propose to do then is to sketch very rapidly the history, geography, politics of South Africa, up to the present time, uh, go on to look at the various connections which exist between the United States and South Africa and then do an update on what is happening at the present time and what the indications are of what is going to develop there. I think this is an appropriate time to begin <coughs> Uh, to ask what is happening there, if only because in the last two weeks we have seen such dramatic events in another part of the world which must have inevitably an enormous impact on the thinking, the awareness and the policy of people in the United States. What has happened in the past two weeks in Cambodia, and in Vietnam is of so enormous an importance for the people of America, not only in terms of its direct impact but in an examination of its origins and its consequences, that one must at this stage, I think, be willing uh, to be open to questions and ideas and a re-examination of, of certain policies and postures. However, to begin at the beginning then, South Africa or the southern portion of the continent of Africa was first settled by white settlers in 1652 uh, when a uh, refreshment station was established there uh, for ships of the Dutch East India Company traveling to the East Indies a trade of spices and silks and ivory and gold. And gradually the small settlement at the tip at the Cape expanded into the interior, sometimes peacefully, generally not so peacefully. Uh, you had that trek into the hinterland, crossing one river after another, one mountain range after another, fighting one battle after another. All the images of the opening up of the West, 
of wars with the Indians or the original Americans. All those images are repeated in South Africa. The process of conquest is pretty much the same. The two important events where there's a sudden leap in the development of the country. The first was the discovery of diamonds around Kimberley, and the second, the discovery of gold around what is now Johannesburg. Both of these gave a sudden impetus to the development of the country and also to its industrialization and drew into the economy uh, the black population. About the same time as the wars of conquest are taking place, about the same time you have the Africans themselves grouping into larger bodies in an attempt to stem the colonial invasion, and this not succeeding. But the tensions always existed between the colonists and the colonized until what was four separate provinces, the Cape, the Transvaal, the Orange Free State and the Cape, joined in 1910 to form the Union <coughs> of South Africa with, among other purposes, that of settling what was called the native problem. Uh, from 1910 to 1960 you have the Union and then South Africa becomes the Republic of South Africa, breaks with the British Commonwealth and no longer recognizes the Queen or the head of the British state as the head of South Africa. There's one theme running through all this, the theme of conquest, of subjugation. And in this particular area, again, there's one rather sudden uh, interruption. The British decision uh, to emancipate the slaves in the 1830s led to the Dutch settlers who had trekked into the interior taking a decision that they would escape further into the interior in order to escape British control. And they issued a quite famous manifesto. It's one of the treasured documents of South African history, rather like the Declaration of Independence here. But it is a declaration which declares that the white settlers will trek into the interior in defense of their sacred right to hold slaves. That this was the right which they felt most important, that it was a right being denied to them. And of course this is a curious paradox, that people should take action in defense of their right to deprive others of their rights. They crossed the Vaal River and established the state called the Transvaal. And with an even greater irony, they went into the area along the Orange River and established a state called the Orange Free State. And it was a state in which only whites were free and blacks were slaves and where whites had the freedom to be slave holders. And the first thing they did in their independent states was to, of course, write a constitution. And the first clause of the constitution was to declare that there shall be no equality in church or state between black and white. And I find it sometimes revealing that the church uh, received precedence over the state in this decision uh, to maintain inequality. From the time when the gold and uh, diamond diggings were established, it was necessary to regulate relations between black and white more precisely and to legislate for it. And so you have in South African history 
a whole series of acts, legislative acts, periodically amended, but all under the same heading. They are called Master and Servant Acts. I guess I should say Master and Servant, except that I worked in Britain for a while, and so my accent is British influenced. At the present time, and I'm going to round off the political, the kind of historical review I'm doing at this stage. At the present time, what you have in South Africa is a series of laws regulating black and white relations in the field of education, in the field of labor, in just about every area you can think of, including who you can fall in love with and where you may be buried. And in every area, the relationship between black and white is clearly defined, clearly regulated. And the old notion of master and servant relation runs through it all. At the present time, the South Africa has a population of about 24 million by the last census, of which roughly one-sixth are white and the rest are classified as non-white. Uh, that's an important uh, classification which I think is sometimes lost sight of. There are gradations of blackness, shades of blackness or brownness in South Africa. But the signs on the buses and outside the public libraries and in the parks will say whites only, non-whites only. And so the division is in fact between white and non-white. So of course the non-whites, coloreds, Asians, Bantu as they're called, are further subdivided and there are certain special laws which pertain to each and uh, I'll return briefly to those later on. But you have at the present time one-sixth of the population, white sixth, controlling all power in the country. There is a parliament, but every member of parliament is white, and only whites can elect people to parliament so that the non-whites or blacks, as they now prefer to call themselves, can neither elect nor be elected. And that is as basic a definition of the South African system as you can get of where power resides. And all legislative power resides in the hands of white South Africans. Uh, one could go on and talk about various other aspects of the system, but it is not apartheid, as the policy is called, that I want to discuss this evening. Uh, simply, it reduces itself, as the present Prime Minister said, Mr. Forster, in a speech long ago, there is only one question in South African politics. The question is, who is to be? the master. And this is what South African politics is about. But perhaps at question time we can get into things like Bantu stands, uh, job reservation, all kinds of specific aspects of apartheid. I want to turn straight away to the uh, American connection. We start with the knowledge that the diamond mines of South Africa are the most important in the world. South Africa is the world's largest producer of diamonds. And the South African gold mines are the most important and the largest producer of gold in the world. South Africa is also the second in the world in the production of platinum. And while the figure is not revealed because it's a strategic material, South Africa is among the top countries in the world in the production of uranium. So notwithstanding the comparatively small population, clearly there are economic areas 
in which South Africa is of very considerable importance. I guess I need not add that the largest purchaser of South African gold is the United States and that most of it is buried in the ground at Fort Knox. This is a fairly obvious connection, but there are others, uh, both economic and political, and I want to specify some of these. Uh, the United Nations publication lists 353 American corporations active in South Africa. The resistance movements themselves list over 400. But let's settle for the United Nations figure, uh, 353. You can go right down the alphabet from A to Z, or from Alice Chalmers and American Motors, down to Burroughs, John Deere. You can take in GM and Ford and Chrysler. You can take in IBM and Polaroid a national cash register, and work your way down until you get to Xerox and beyond that to Zenith, and you'll find them all there. They're all there, and they're all functioning within the apartheid system. They all conform to a series of laws which in essence regulate relationship between black and white on a basis of master and servant. The specifics of these, and one doesn't just talk of master and servant as something sentimental, what it means for the black South African is for one that he is not permitted uh, to join a registered trade union. For another, a certain jobs are sealed off to him by law. They include certain fairly elementary ones like being an elevator operator, which is a job reserved for white South Africans only. And if a black South African were hired for such a job, he would go to prison and the white person who hired him would go to prison as well. So the whole labor uh, scale in terms of skills and wages is regulated by denying blacks the right to collective bargaining, at the same time denying them advancement on the ladder of promotions by simply under the Job Reservation Act, declaring that certain jobs are not for blacks. But what happens if the blacks get out of hand? How does the state deal with them then? Well, this is where Polaroid and IBM are very useful. All black adult males are required to carry on their person at all time what is called a pass book or the book of life. And this book contains information about their birthplace, where they are employed, where they live, and all kinds of information about ethnic origins and where their Bantustan may be. The book, in a sense, is a keystone of the whole apartheid system. For one thing, any black who cannot produce the book on demand goes to prison. You must have it on your person at all time. And if you were raided, as police often raid at night in the ghettos, if you were found in bed without your passbook, you could go to prison for that as well. It must be produced on demand. But it is more complex than that because your employer has to stamp it each week. And you may have the book on your person and it may be in order, 
But if your employer has not stamped it, then the book is invalid and you will go to prison because it is not valid. So you must get it stamped each week and that in turn means that you must be very careful not to be fired from the job. But if you were fired, there would be a further complication because each week in the ghetto, when you pay rent for the municipal housing to the municipal superintendent, he has to stamp a receipt in your passbook. But if, in fact, your employer has not stamped it so that there is no evidence that you are employed, then the superintendent is compelled by law to refuse to accept your rent for the house in the ghetto. So that if the book is not in order, you can lose not only your job, but also your home and your right to be in the city at all. And if you continue in the city with a passbook which is not in order, you will go to prison, of course, uh, for having a book which is not in order. This is independent of the mere right to be in the city at night after nine o'clock. For that you need a special pass called a night pass, which is valid only for a single night and allows you to be in the city for that particular night. The function of this passbook is, as I'm sure you can perceive, essentially for control and for the regulation of labor. And in your passbook is your photograph supplied by Polaroid and your computer number supplied by IBM on special machines built on contract to the South African government. So that certain American corporations are intimately involved in the very process of control. But many of them are involved in the perhaps more important process of exploitation. For most of South African labor, obviously, in a country where five-sixths of the population is black, most of the labor in South Africa is black. And if you were to go to Ford or GM or Chrysler or Metalbox or whatever it was, you would find that the overwhelming number of workers in each plant were black workers. Workers who cannot join a trade union, cannot bargain collectively for better wages, and cannot go on strike. For there are two laws covering that. And no black is permitted to go on strike. If he does, this is a crime. And no black is permitted to talk about going on strike. This is a crime known as incitement to strike. Last year they did a bit of uh, window dressing and the newspapers were full of stories that blacks would in future be allowed to strike. But if you read the fine print, you found out that if blacks had a grievance, they had to report it to the bosses. And if after three years, they got no satisfaction from the bosses, they then had to give the, note, the notice to the bosses that they would go on strike in two years' time. And uh, you can see how you can appear to change without, in fact, uh, really changing. Well, then, uh, perhaps this doesn't need spelling out. We have 353 American corporations operating in South Africa using a most marvelous reservoir of docile black labor of labor which is not only cheap, but is powerless, which can be exploited the whole year round and has no defense against underpayment, 
the malnutrition, the children dying in the ghettos, the desperate housing conditions, for all these there is no redress. And your reservoir of labor is always there, is always under control, is always regulated by the passbooks, courtesy of Polaroid and IBM. If we look at this picture, and this is the South African picture, and this is the Central American connection with South Africa, we still have to look at the political dimension. And it's a long one, or rather it has a long history. I don't propose to go over all that, except to choose maybe the three uh, salient points. In the 60s, the United States policy towards Southern Africa, and particularly South Africa, was that it would neither encourage nor discourage investment in South Africa. And this was a pleasantly neutral posture while, of course, investment continued all the time. But the official state posture was one of neutrality. In the 70s, that has changed significantly. And it's changed on two levels. On a superficial public level and a much more fundamental private level. And there's been a fair amount of material written on it uh, so that it's not difficult to research. And what you need to look at is two memoranda drafted by Henry Kissinger, the security memorandum 38, and then particularly the one uh, NSSM 39, drafted in 1970, and which began to take effect very clearly. support to the black states in Africa and support black aspirations, black uh, self-determination. But that privately, the United States would give increased support to the white minority regimes in southern Africa, and this is Rhodesia or Zimbabwe, and specifically South Africa. And one of the important elements of the recommendation was that while the United States had adopted a policy of an embargo on the sale of arms to South Africa, the terms of this embargo would now be interpreted more liberally. So that things that had previously been classified as military could be classified as possibly military, but they would be sold for civilian use. Perhaps the outstanding example, if you need one here, is in the sale of jets, which are sold as uh, private jets, but are convertible by the South Africans uh, for armed purposes, for counterinsurgency activities against guerrillas, all kinds of things, spotter planes and things like that. So you have uh, by some reports, a sale of about $50 million in the sale of jet aircraft alone to South Africa. Parallel with that has gone a quite spectacular increase over the last five years of investment in South Africa, a 35% increase over the last five years. But what is happening is that while publicly the U.S. continues to declare 
its support for black aspirations and self-determination. Privately, there's been increased support for white South Africa. And this is not only extended in terms of sales from the Defense Department, but in actual exchanges between military advisors traveling from South Africa to the United States, meeting with top people in the Defense Department, meeting with the top contractors to the Defense Department, meeting with experts in the Pentagon. So what we see is an acceleration of the economic involvement, a tilt, this is the classic word used by Jack Anderson when he first leaked the NSSM 39 memorandum in his column, a tilt politically and perhaps most significantly a boosting up of military support for under five million whites committed to white mastery, what they call Bas Skup, Bas meaning boss or master, committed to white supremacy by what seems to me a gross absurdity, committed to white supremacy on a black continent of almost 500 million people. It seems to me that this folly, this idiocy, will in time appear as monumental as I have no doubt the, the Vietnam adventure is beginning to seem to many people now. But that the United States should wish to commit its support monetarily, politically, and uh, militarily in defense of a racist minority in South Africa seems to me to be a great many things, unjust of course, undemocratic of course, but also extremely foolish and stupid. This then is the picture to the present time. I want to just explore one other area and then look at some of its implications. But let me add the clincher in terms of military significance. In the last two weeks it has been revealed that the United States has sold to South Africa nuclear fuel sufficient to arm nine nuclear warheads. This has appeared in various papers in Texas and elsewhere and hopefully uh, you are already aware of it. But that seems to me the ultimate commitment, the willingness to supply South Africa with the material for nuclear weapons. Well I want to get into another area now and that's a very curious area and a very a very dismaying area. It's one which uh, makes me very despondent and perhaps will uh, make you view it in the same way. Six months ago, or a little more now, in October of last year, South Africa was in very bad shape. White, racist South Africa. They saw the Portuguese being kicked out of Mozambique where Frelimo had waged a successful liberation struggle. The Portuguese had already been kicked out of Guinea-Bissau, further north on the west coast. And the Portuguese were in the process of withdrawing from Angola. In addition, guerrilla activities on the outer frontiers of South Africa, which is Zimbabwe or Rhodesia, where so far most of the armed clashes have taken place, guerrilla activities in that area were being stepped up. And Smith, with his minority government of less than a quarter of a million whites in Zimbabwe, was under extreme pressure. In addition, South Africa was facing extremely severe pressure at another forum at the United Nations where a concerted effort was being made to expel South Africa from the United Nations on the very simple argument that the credentials of the ambassadors who represented South Africa were false, were fraudulent. 
They claimed to represent the whole country, but in fact they had been elected by one-sixth of the country, and that the other five-sixths were totally voiceless and voteless, and therefore were not represented. Well, under these pressures, the South African ambassador made a speech in October last year, in which he said that he begged the United Nations not to expel his country. And he went on to say that if you give us six months, the situation is going to be dramatically transformed. Well, this was a serious promise. People sat up and listened. What many people failed to hear was a speech that same week in Bloemfontein by the Prime Minister of South Africa, Mr. Forster. And Mr. Forster said, of course things are going to be dramatically changed in the next six months. But you must understand two things. Nothing is going to change inside South Africa. The white man is going to continue to be the master and the blacks are not going to get the vote. You must understand that. So when you took these two statements together and you looked for change, clearly they must have been talking about change outside South Africa, if nothing was going to change inside. And a lot of us uh, sat up expectantly and wondered, you don't make promises like that unless you can deliver. And so we waited, and then in December came the news. Mr. Forster had secretly been flying to the capitals of other African countries and his cabinet ministers had been jetting all over the continent of Africa having one series of secret meetings after another. Well, that sounded a little familiar. Well, one had heard of these things in other parts of the world. But it developed that not only had they made these contacts, but the contacts had been successful and that black states in Africa, which had refused ever to talk to Forster, as long as he represented only a white minority and did not have any regard for the interests of the blacks, and these countries not only had entertained Forster's representatives and Forster himself, but now we're prepared to go to the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, which represents the continent, and there plead on behalf of Mr. Forster that he should be given time to work out a solution for South Africa. They not only took their plea there, but two weeks ago, when the OAU met in emergency session to discuss the question of dialogue with South Africa, the decision was taken in the OAU by a majority that dialogue with South Africa should be continued. Now, when we talk about this dialogue, you must take into account one very important factor. If Mr. Forster wants time, what is it he wants time for? And what is the solution that he is working towards? Well, it's been spelled out. We know it. But some of you I know are familiar with it. It is a solution called Bantustans. And Bantustans have a whole series of ramifications, and I'll just touch on a few of them. First of all, 13% of the total area of South Africa will be given to the blacks, 87% to the whites. And then the 13% will be divided into nine separate 
black states. So that you have to think of that 13% carved up in nine segments of different sizes. And each of them will have a black ruler and a black parliament. But this parliament will have no autonomy. It will still be dependent on Pretoria and the white government. In addition, since these are the poorest areas of the land into which, mark you, you are supposed to squeeze 87% of the population onto 13% of the land, you have impoverished land, overcrowded, overstocked, without any mineral wealth, with few natural resources. And this is to be the solution the just solution to the South African problem. To give the blacks 13% of the land and then carve it up into nine segments so that they can fight among each other and each of those nine segments smaller than the total white population so that not one of them can be a threat to the white population. Impoverished, dependent and above all 60% of the blacks would still have to work in the white areas but have no political rights there because they were not citizens of white South Africa. They would carry passports of their own little one-ninth of the black area. They would have their votes there in areas which they may never see but they would continue to deliver their labor in the white areas, continue to work for Alice Chalmers and American Motors and Chrysler and John Deere and Ford and GM and all the rest of them. So by a clever kind of confidence trick, you ensure that you have the man's labor without giving him any political rights and you promise him political rights in an area which is politically impotent and not even economically viable. In many ways, Bantustans are even uglier than that because there are certain aspects which relate not merely to the denial of political rights but simply to the denial of existence at all. What is happening in South Africa, and there's an excellent film on it, indeed there are two now which you ought to see, one made by British television called The Dumping Grounds, and another one made by a black South African and smuggled out of South Africa called Last Grave at Dimbaza. What is happening is that the Africans living in the cities once they are too old or too sick to work and those who are too young to work are all defined as unproductive and are then taken in trucks out of the cities, out of the ghettos and dumped into areas of semi-desert. Sometimes there are shanties. Sometimes they have to haul up their bits of cardboard and metal and tin in the city and take them with them on the trucks into the bush and set up their homes there. Sometimes when they arrive there, all that they find is a row of graves, open graves for those who die. There are no other provisions. Water comes after a time, sanitation after a time. Medical care is almost non-existent. Shops are not there. Nor is there any way of making a living out of the earth. For this is arid ground, semi-desert. And people are dying there 
at a rate which the South African government conceals. But a black American judge was in South Africa some time ago. His name is Booth, Judge Booth, president of the American Committee on Africa. And he went to South Africa as an observer at a particular trial, and that was his only business. He was only permitted there for the purpose. But he got away briefly to one of these dumping grounds. And when he returned to New York, he reported at the United Nations. And one of the memorable things he reported was finding this group of shanties in the open felt. And then noticing at the entrance to it, there were 14 small open graves. And he asked why they were there and where were the corpses. And the people explained, well, there weren't any dead babies now. But since about 14 died every day, they would dig that number of graves each day in anticipation. So you see, the Bantustan system may well be more than merely a political stratagem for the denial of political rights. If there's any place in the world where people are being systematically killed off by law in a policy which we used to call genocide, then it is happening in South Africa. And when the United States is involved in apartheid in South Africa, it is more than involvement in exploitation, more than collusion in oppression. It is also an accomplice in murder, in systematic murder. And for those of you who have studied Vietnam and Cambodia, that no doubt will not be a shock. Well, I guess I ought to end with some notes of optimism at least, and so I will refer to one or two things which seem to me significant in the United States. There has always been in the churches a concern about corporate involvement in Southern Africa. And this has grown, regrettably, it has made very little impact, it has made so little impact that I sometimes wonder if it is not an exercise in futility. But it does seem to me true that as long as people in this country can express a moral concern, that out of that moral concern can grow an indignation and a determination to reverse American policy American involvement in South Africa. There are, of course, a number of organizations, a number of publications, Africa Report published in New York, Africa Today published in, at the University of Denver, and various publications such as those of the African Liberation Solidarity Committee attempting to alert people in this country to the various dangers, the various evils. And if you were to run them down, I would say not only is there this massive involvement, but there is now increasing involvement. And beyond that, it is ultimately a destructive involvement, destructive of human life in South Africa and destructive of human life in this country. For if people in this country get involved in our struggle, and inevitably the struggle will escalate, then we must anticipate the same kind of embarrassment and humiliation as we are now seeing on the television screens. The blacks of South Africa, like the blacks of Mozambique, the blacks of Angola, the blacks of Zimbabwe, the blacks of Namibia, are committed to change and have reached the point where they recognize that change is only possible through armed struggle, that all other means of change have been exhausted, 
or have been outlawed. It is no accident that it is a crime for anyone to read my poetry in South Africa or to own a book of my poems or to quote a single line from a poem in a review. That is a criminal act. It is no accident that the South Africans have to seal up the system and hold it down because the thrust of black aspiration, of black determination is there all the time and has to be contained, sometimes spectacularly, as it was at Sharpville when 79 Africans were shot in the back, sometimes by imprisonment, as I was imprisoned on Robben Island with a thousand other political prisoners. And perhaps I should end with one last revealing little story. When I was on Robben Island in prison, I spent 18 months there breaking stones with Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu, Ahmed Kathrada and the other people of the resistance movement. There was a pail in the center of the courtyard where we broke stones. And if you wanted to go to the urinal, you had to go to the pail but you had to get permission from the warder before you could go and put up your hand and say, please sir, or please boss. But when you put up your hand, the warder would suddenly be very interested in the clouds, or the sky, or the birds, and so he wouldn't notice you. And you could wait for half an hour and not get permission. When this happened to me, I walked over to the pail and didn't wait for permission. And the warder came up to me with his automatic rifle and leveled it at me and said, uh, you know you can't move without my permission. And I said, sure, but I tried to get your attention and it didn't work. And then he said, he didn't want to fight with me and he could have beaten me over the head as he did sometimes. But he said, look, you seem like an intelligent chap. Oh, why is it you so dumb? Why do you try to fight us? You know you can't win. This whole resistance movement is nonsense. You can never win. Why do you try? And I said to him, why are you so sure that you can't lose? And he said to me, don't worry. Our friends will take care of us. England and America will see to it that we stay in power. And that seems to me the simple-minded man, but he seized on what I think was one of the essential truths in South Africa, and a truth most blacks in South Africa understand very clearly, that the white minority in South Africa could not remain in power if they were not kept in power by their allies elsewhere. And if they are to fall, if justice is ever to come to South Africa, it will have to come by the combined efforts of people in this country and my own to remove this underpinning, this undergirding of the system of oppression, of exploitation, that indeed exists in this country as much as it does in my own. That is a connection I will not attempt to make. But for the black man working in Detroit, or indeed in Chicago, he has no illusions about who his exploiter is. What he fails to do is to make the connection, the South African-American connection, it is GM in Detroit, as it is GM in South Africa, and all that that entails. That is the connection we need to break. Thank you.
have a question and answer period, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And I should also say that there will be a reception following at the Black Cultural Center. Are there any questions? Yes, I'm very glad you bring it up because it reinforces some of the points I made earlier. About the time when South Africa was being threatened with expulsion from the UN, the US Secretary for Africa was traveling in Africa at the time. You may remember that South Africa was saved from expulsion from the UN by the use of the veto for the first time in history by three of the veto powers, Britain, France, and the United States. But Donald Eason, the Secretary for Africa, traveling in Africa at the time, was traveling in comparatively liberal African countries, perhaps very liberal, that's a debatable matter. But among other places, he was in Tanzania and in Zambia. And he made a statement that while the United States had saved South Africa from expulsion at the UN on this occasion, South Africa could not rely on the United States doing the same thing in the future. It didn't seem to be a very strong statement, but it was a statement not only repudiated by Kissinger, but subsequently Isam was fired. So the one man who made an even half-hearted gesture of support to the rest of Africa and made it in countries like Tanzania and Zambia highly critical of the U.S. support for South Africa, uh, Donald Eason was eased out of his position. And the sequel to that is even more worrying because the man who's taken over is a man who was in Chile at the fall of Allende and deeply involved in it. And this is the man whom Kissinger has chosen to run his Africa desk for him. And it was on the announcement of this selection that the whole of Africa through the OAU expressed its alarm that this man who was so notorious and you must mark it, before he was in Chile, he was in Guatemala. So that's the kind of man he is. He now runs the Africa desk. And when the OAU protested, Kissinger wrote a stinging, some would even say insulting letter, rejecting the African protest. And I think that's very revealing. Thanks for raising it. 